Hello everyone. Hello. 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 So my name is Ankita Saxena and I'm going to present the keynote which was presented by Eric Horwitz and Computing Community Consortium in Washington DC on June 7, 2016. Who is, who is Eric Horwitz? I'm coming to that point. Okay. <laughs> so the keynote was on artificial intelligence in support of people and society. So for those uh, okay. who are not familiar with Eric Horwitz, he is the managing director of Microsoft's main resource lab in Redmond. His work is mostly on artificial intelligence and machine intelligence and mostly focused on complementarities of the human and machine reasoning. He's a pretty cool guy and has been elected a fellow of Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, National Academy of Engineering, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, American Association for the Advancement of Science. And there are a couple of more things which I have. Where did you go to school? Well, he is a unique computer scientist, I would say, because in addition to have his PhD degree, he also has an MD from Stanford. Okay. PhD, MD from Stanford, both of them? Okay. So we'll just go back and see what artificial intelligence, just one slide for that. So in 1955, when this term artificial intelligence was first used in the proposal, the founders said that to find what artificial intelligence should be, to find how to make machines solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans. But now in 2016, how we define artificial intelligence as it is an intelligence exhibited by machines in computer science, an ideal intelligent machine is a flexible, rational agent that perceives its environment and takes action that maximizes its chances of success at some goal. So what about the foundations of AI? The foundations of AI, we talk about perception, learning, reasoning, and natural languages, which are very critical to human beings. But over the period of time, this is not just the artificial intelligence. It has been added on by computer vision, speech and dialogue, decision and plans, robotics, and many more things. Then we had an era called AI winter. So this was an... So AI, AI winter was an era when there was reduced funding and interest on artificial uh, intelligence researchers. But what Eric says about AI winter is, AI winter is the most productive time in AI history. What time, what, what, what years are we talking about? We are talking about somewhere in late 80s kind of time. Okay. And what time? What, huh? In what time? How yeah. long did it last? Mid, mid of 90s or early 90s. 10 years. Yeah. That kind of time. Yeah. So um, was it just the bureaucrats and venture capitalists? All this is what we get from Wikipedia. Okay. Well, it wasn't just the bureaucrats and venture capitalists. There were a lot of people, um, primarily Winograd and Flores, I would say, would be a, a key one. Terry Winograd, right? Does that name mean anything to you guys? Winograd. W-I-N-O-G-R-A-D. Winograd. Terry Winograd. Um, who wrote a book. They wrote a book called Understanding Computers and Cognition. It came out in 1986. And it really complained about how AI was being oversold. Uh, and I, I think that certainly contributed to this. And then, of course, you know that Shank also you know, contributed to that. But I, I would say Rio Grande and Flores, and then also, um, also out of Stanford, um, I think Bill Clancy also sort of promoted this view that AI had been oversold. So all of the um, medical diagnostic expert systems were not really doing the job of medical diagnosis. And so that, that sort of cast a, a shadow. And 
made some of these people, um, certainly Terry Winograd and certainly Bill Clancy, um, rethink the scope of what they, they, were, they were doing. And I would say those people in particular are still pretty suspicious and, and, and pretty skeptical about the capabilities of, of AI. Um, do you think that using Ford Weiser actually influenced AI? Maybe. It was just another angle that, you know, pushed the natural language stuff and semantic issues, semantic representation. Actually, Maybe that really, yeah. Interaction with the web, so yeah. any kind of game, so online transaction. Yeah. <clears throat> So may maybe what happened is that that you know intelligence got incorporated into applications, everyday applications. Certainly, um, Google and Google Search yeah. um, exemplify the exploitation of, of intelligence. Cert some kind of intelligence, at least. So yeah, maybe what happened is that the the, the world forced uh, um, a more optimistic view. But I but. I take issue with this. I would not say it's just government bureaucrats and venture capitalists. I really do think, out of Stanford in particular, because that, that's mm -hmm. Terry Winograd and and and, um, and Clancy both came out of that environment. So what Eric meant to say here that when we were considering there is no work going on in AI, but there at that point of time even a lot of people were working on AI and. They were researching new things. So there's something more which he has to mention about AI. There have been concerns about the long-term prospect that we lose control of certain kinds of intelligences. I fundamentally don't think that's going to happen. I think that we will be very proactive in terms of how we field AI systems and that in the end we'll be able to get incredible benefits from machine intelligence in all realms of life, from science to education to economics to daily life. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just, this, last, this last thing is really bothering me. <laughs> it wasn't just bureaucrats uh -huh. and, and, and venture capitalists. Um, you had um, over across the bay, this is what we're talking San Francisco here, right? This is Stanford primarily. Over across the bay, um, you had Searle, the philosopher of mine, John Searle, and you had Hubert Dreyfus, um, really questioning whether or not the kinds of symbolic reasoning that were coming out of expert systems at the time captured human reasoning. And those, a lot of those uh, people are still very prominent and, and, and respected today. Um, the other day in class, um, somebody, I think Amit mentioned uh, William Woods, what's in a link? Do you remember that? He said, no, you don't remember that? Oh. Yes, okay, because I said, yeah, it's, it's a very, very important paper. And I, and I said, um, yeah, you're, you're, you're right, that, that paper was a really important paper. And that paper, I believe, I haven't confirmed it, but it was at least published around the same time as an extremely influential book called Mind Design by John Hoagland, H-A-U-G-L-A-N-D. And, and can somebody, can somebody look that up? I think that's like 83-ish or something like that. What's it in that book? It's not in that book? Okay. Well, it's the same theme, <laughs> same kinds of issues. Um, and is that, I think it's like 83 or 80. 83. Yeah, it is old. I know it's old. But it's the same vintage as this skepticism. And you will find in that book a lot of people who are very concerned about whether or not machines can ever mimic human intelligence. So I, I don't think it's I don't think it's this control issue. I think it has to do with whether or not the kinds of reasoning that we see machines able to do are actually representative of human capability. When it, what is that? What? Mind design. You go the first. second version is in 97, so it's not that the first version. Okay. 
So you'll find um, Dreyfus is in there, McDermott is in there, um, a, a lot of people questioning from a philosophy of mind perspective whether or not computers can ever really <coughs> capture um, human capability. And I think that's what was at the root of this. Did you find the date? 1981. 81, okay. So you can see the seeds of this in, in, in 81. So Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, so that I want to say that's not something actually human reasoning. That's we want to. Okay, so so you could have different kinds of human reasoning, and maybe it's cap. Maybe the machines are capable of doing a certain type of human that, reasoning. That kind of thing. Yeah. Certain kind of logical, deductive reasoning, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's 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 one way to, to think about it, but there were there were a lot of people that were just really concerned that 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 we were overselling machine capability and underselling human capability, not not really understanding what humans do. And I would say the main um, um, skeptics were across the bay at UC Berkeley. That's, it was sort of Berkeley and Stanford kind of butting heads. With Carnegie Mellon sort of in between, you had some people at Carnegie Mellon that were on both sides. That's my recollection. I was there. Okay. So from 1955, when AI it just got born, there has been there have been a lot of inflection points. So first thing is computation and memory. At that point of time, the, compu uh, the computation cost and memory they were very expensive. But nowadays, if we see memory is, I mean, we are storing data almost for free. We we store petabytes and zettabytes of data on clouds, and we are not paying that much as it used to be in earlier days. And Nowadays, we have access to, easy access to web data. There has been a lot of learning on that data. We can reason those things. So there has been a lot of changes from the birth of <coughs> artificial intelligence. So when these things going on, uh, in late 90s, like in 1997, a team in SUNY Buffalo, led by Govinda Raju, they were working on handwriting recognition. And a part of it, or maybe the whole thing, is nowadays being used by US Postal Services for reading the addresses mentioned on the letters. So earlier, everyone has to read an address, sort it out, and then send it wherever it is meant to be. But nowadays, the machines are doing all that stuff. They go to the envelope, read the stuff, match it with the data set, and, put it, and sort it according to the area. So as of now, 25 billion letters are scanned per day by this system. And hundreds of millions of dollars are saved. Does that seem like artificial intelligence to you? Does that seem like artificial intelligence? Does that meet your, your, yeah. huh? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. What is intelligent? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Huh? I don't see. You don't, you don't think it's intelligent? No. Okay, so she doesn't think it's intelligent. Why? Why is it? Why is it intelligent? Because you, you correct it. So Remember, this say, is a word from 1997. Yeah, for that, for that particular year, was some progress, but was not really intelligent as we define now today. Why? Why do you think that? 
That is just make job easier. Yeah. It's not intelligent. I don't find that. What do you guys think? Intelligent? Why? Find that up. The machine is doing what human does. So artificial intelligence is like replicating uh, whatever human does. Okay, uh, now, so wait a minute now. I digest food. Yeah, and I sneeze. Yeah. And I blink my eyes. I do lots of things that you would probably call intelligent. <laughs> now, Many the other things besides that yeah. that you probably wouldn't call intelligent. Currently, all the family factors, they do human job, so, but they are not, they are not uh, artificial. It means they are not intelligent. So they are factory only. They are machine work. Right? You can't call it all of them terrible. So see, um, actually, maybe we can divide artificial intelligence to the passive and active artificial intelligence, kind of passive things. Passive? Yeah, I mean, something classified, doesn't learn from its learning, it's, you know, you want to distinguish that. Okay. It's not dynamic. Yeah. So when I read the, there's a link or a paper related to this, and when I read it, I thought it had something to do with assigning goals in here. Uh, d how much does goals in a deciding what to do instead of just executing, but actually with your active, you're actually deciding what to do next, yeah. and how much of that is intelligence, as opposed to this passive execution of a task somebody else gives you. Yeah. So it's a kind of new learning approach. It's called active learning. Mm -hmm. uh, in comparison to the traditional machine learning, so you train, uh, learn. you're learning new features, and, uh, and you learn from your our okay. recent learning. Mm. So, what is there anything in, in, in that's going on in this handwriting recognition thing that makes you think that there <coughs> is some intelligence there? Uh, they probably weren't doing that at the time. Maybe they were. I have. I don't know this particular. I was at SUNY Buffalo at the time, uh, but I didn't know this particular team. It's just Okay. So is that intelligent? To some extent. Why? At that time, yes. Why? 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 There I is. Mean, there is a kind of matching. Huh? It's a kind of a matching. Yeah. It's and yes. and the, the problem it's is not it's, it's using the intelligence. It's it's yeah. partial. It's partial pattern matching. Right? It's not, it's not a perfect pattern match. And I think that's the place mm -hmm. where the intelligence and the decision making become relevant. So, you, I mean, this is, if it were, instead of, if it were, you know, scene recognition, object recognition, you wouldn't have any problem calling that intelligent, right? So, I think, to the extent that you have partial pattern matching going on, it exemplifies. So I have a question by answering my question, so I think you can get your answer here. So you remember everywhere, some companies, they have um, uh, finger scanning, uh -huh. or, or you go to some immigration, so you have a, a finger yeah. scanning. So mm -hmm. do you think that is intelligent? Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. What do you guys think? What do you think? So if it's no, if your answer is no, so here is no. Uh it's yeah. certainly cognition that's classified as an artificial <laughs> so, so it's somehow family the same family job. Well, so this relates to what you're reading, like with similarity and categorization. So if you can group into like instances, this leads to analogical reasoning. Yeah. So, but are you actually seeing this link or the relationships, or are you just seeing the surface features? Yeah. Both of them. I mean, so, are they recognizing just the letters themselves, or are they like tying the relationships of the letters to a word, or? Yeah, well, well, we are more likely handwriting recognition. Right. That's it. So whenever there is an address, it's all. It's not typed. It's it's handwritten. So, so read that address. Infer. So if I have some, I have some lovely scrawl. Um, and I'm writing uh, Dayton, and if I the D is legible, uh, but you know the Aiden is, <laughs> is a scrawl. K 
can they infer what town I came from by say my zip code, which is legible? I mean, yeah, but it is reading your zip code too. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't really know. I guess we really have to dig. We have to dig into exactly what they what they did here, and and you know, are they using information from one part of the address? to inform their interpretation of another part of the address, you know, so that it starts looking, you know, knowledge-based mm -hmm. driven, then we feel a little bit better about the whole thing. And also, whether it really recognizes, this, this system is really recognizing the alphabet in any case or only the matching the word. That is the difference. Yeah. So alphabet matching, so any kind of writing A, it can recognize that's A, and uh, can understand, okay, this is alphabet by English, for example, or we have alphabet in Turkish also different, so A, two dots is above that. So that kind, we have to know in details more, so we can't just generally yeah. say whether this is intelligent or this is just matching. Yeah. So, I yeah, agree. maybe that over there, maybe in that particular time period, maybe it's only matching, so matching uh, not that much they don't, they didn't progress that much to learn the system, to teach the system this much. So. Yeah, yeah, we have to look into it. But there's reasons, there's, so there's pros and cons, right? There's, there's some things that make you think it's intelligent and some things that make you yes. suspicious that it's not. Okay. Yeah, you should know about that more in but, detail. Yeah, but you know, saving hundreds of millions of dollars, that's good. No matter what you call that's it. That's what matters. <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> So now we move to the new era of artificial intelligence. The so new competencies and experiences. The breakthrough we got, one of the examples what Microsoft has given is a Skype translate. So for this, I'll show you a small video. So uh, any second now, I'm expecting a call from Melanie and here she is. Good afternoon, Melanie. How are you? Mir geht es dir. Mir geht es gut. Wie geht es dir? Well, how is it, me friends? Sorry, Melanie. Say that again. Melanie, sag das noch mal. Mir geht es gut. Wie geht es dir? I am well. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. I'm here at the Worldwide Partner Conference with 16,000 partners and our CEO on the big stage. So no pressure. Gut, danke. Ich bin hier. Aber weltweite Partnerkonferenz mit 16,000 Palmos auf der großen Bühne. Also, kein Druck. How was that for you German speakers? Is it okay? <laughs> Have seen the World Cup. So here you are saying that these are very small sentences, you know, some 20 words or so. So this also shows uh, an example where there was a really long sentence and it has translated it to German correctly, I guess. I'll directly move but, uh, to the part. Actually, uh, for any language, a script is able to translate with the same. Okay. I mean, how accurate was the expansion of the language? Yeah. Well, Did you make any research? It should work for uh, the major languages. I'm not sure about, you know, there are certain regional languages. Or I'm not sure about that. But, yeah, it is working for all the global languages what we have. Define working. Because I've used, I've used Google Translate. Mm -hmm to write in French. You guys use Google Translate? But, it's but that's not proper translation. It isn't. But you can see it here. I yeah. mean, there's errors. So what's, is there a good enough? Are we, I mean, have, we're missing a U maybe? Yeah. And we're missing a question mark? Yeah. Uh, actually, it's still for translation. Uh, 
translation for European language is in a good shape, but for other languages, it's much more worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So probably they have focused only on European languages. Yeah. I mean, so you know, I guess from Beth's perspective, you can understand. I mean, it's pretty incredible, but it's not. There, it it's still not has airs, and yeah. he had to ask her to repeat because it didn't pick up the first mm -hmm. time. I don't know German, so I don't know how well it translated what he said. Yeah, well, but Saida does. Yeah. Yeah, it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay, German. So, I mean, it was functional. This afternoon, I fly back to Seattle. Then on Thursday, I fly to New York, followed by Miami, then back to Seattle. And at the end of July, I'm going to fly to the UK to see my friends and family in London. Heute Nachmittag. Ich fliege zurück nach Seattle. Und dann am Donnerstag, ich fliege nach New York, gefolgt von Miami. Und dann zurück nach Seattle. Und am Ende Juli werde ich fliegen nach Großbritannien, um meine Freunde und Familie in London zu sehen. So, that was good? Wow, that sounds like a packed calendar. Good Good journey. Thanks, Melanie. Goodbye. So again, pros and cons. What makes it intelligent? What? What? Why are you impressed? Who's saying this is a question for you? We talked about this issue. Are you there? Who me? Yeah, you. Why are we impressed? I mean, we should be impressed for a couple reasons. Why are we impressed? Really, really big problem in verbal speech that we don't have in written speech. What is that problem? So, well, there's that, but there's something that's really, really fundamental that is a big, huge natural language problem. So is it the problem of same sound, different words? Well, we got that. Words. Yeah, we got that. But there's something that's a really big, big, big thing big. You saying you and I have worried about this forever. This left. Tokenization. There are no word boundaries. There are no real word boundaries in spoken language. So if you look at the speech stream for what I'm saying right now, it, the, the, the speech signal, it would be a continuous wave. There are no dead spots. And so that one of the big problems in speech recognition is finding the word boundaries. And one of the big problems that we have in some of the languages that, that Hussein and I have been interested in, it's the same thing. There's no word boundaries. Word boundaries help a lot. In, in the NLP. And so that's one thing that had to be solved with this, was the tokenization. And that's impressive. Because it, if you look at the signal, if you look at the physical signal, it's, it's just not there. The boundaries are not there. And then, of course, then there's all the rest of it, the parts of speech and the, and, and, you know, the similar sounding sounds and all that sort of stuff that you guys were talking about that's relevant as well. But that tokenization thing is a biggie. So the next thing is models tracking gestures. This is one thing which is uh, in lab in Microsoft as of now, but he has given a, a good model. I'll take a part of his keynote and show you the what he meant by tracking gestures. CNNs are being used or neural networks to actually track roads. And there are things still, you know, 
development still in the laboratory that I'm very excited about. I used to tell my researchers on, on our teams, if you, you get the thumb and forefinger into computational systems, we can build civilizations. Uh, and, and just recently, our, our Cambridge lab uh, designed systems that can really track the graceful, subtle pose of hands. These aren't videos. These are models that are being are tracking gesture. And this really depended on advances in machine learning and inference. What do you think? Intelligent? So you know uh, something that nowadays is intelligent for us is different than something that is intelligent. Back in the olden days when <laughs> does it look does it look intelligent to you? Yes? Um, to some extent, yes. <laughs> okay, why yes? Why yes? Because, <clears throat> because it's actually track the movements very easily and actually correctly distinguish what is. Okay, if I hold my hand up to a mirror and I gesture, no. the mirror will reflect the movements of my hand. No, no. That's not intelligent. No, it's converted to data. Okay. I can say it, it would have controlled by robot. It, it could be intelligent, artificial intelligent, but it's actually somehow, uh, I believe, uh, it's somehow like uh, reading the point that, so it is like a bit more mathematic jobs than rather than artificial intelligence. That's just like a programming field. Mm -hmm. if, if it would have be like a virtual reality, so that's software of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's similar work they have, mm -hmm. but the only thing is, you are controlling the robot, not by your body, your hand, by a keyboard or mm -hmm. some different mm -hmm. institute. So that robot works for you by uh, its intelligence that we have defined for that robot. But here, I can say uh, that's somehow is different because it's according to that body, that man's body. That's natural, actually, intelligent from him. Mm -hmm. Converting no, actually, to the... It's it has sensors. <laughs> gets data from a sensor and convert to other type of data that's a kind of <laughs> transformation that the kind of intelligence is behind. You think it's intelligent? I think we're missing part of what's happening with the simulation. That's important. It's the starting point. So what does the system have to do to get to that point? Mm -hmm. I, I'm. I would assume they're doing some sort of calibration. And if we watch the whole calibration process, we think it's just as intelligent as opposed to having the human just walk up to it and interact and get that automatically. And I wonder, so I, what I think we're seeing and why we may think it's more intelligent, say, than the post office example is because it is using some top-down influence in that it's using some expectancy to map well, this finger is likely to go here because of its proximity. It's not going to jump all the way over here yeah. immediately. So yeah. there's some, but I, I'm not sure you can't get there without some starting point. Okay. Where does it start? So, so what, what I'm hearing from you guys is it's not the accomplishment of the task, per se, that makes something intelligent. It's the way in which the task is accomplished that determines whether or not the process is intelligent. Is that, 
Is that a reasonable summary of what you guys are saying? Yes, yeah, see, uh, we have a tool, as uh, everybody knows, and the name means it is a good mission. Mm -hmm. One very simple and basic way of naming it is a good combination is matching with dictionary. So, is that is name is in this dictionary or not? And to summarize, to the right extent, in, it produces good uh, actual result. The other way of that is using machine learning, classical. Mm -hmm. So there is so much work behind that to distinguish, to, to actually determine these tokens in this uh, mm -hmm. standing for a name entity or not. Mm -hmm. okay. So, <laughs> what was your original definition of intelligence? Can you go back and tell me what that was? You had one, I think, didn't you? Yes. Well, the second part of it. So do these examples meet this? These definitions? So the first part, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans. We're, I think we're good with that. But the second part. For our two examples so far, I, sh I assume you have more. You're gonna, you're going up the ladder probably. Well, I don't have any more examples. On this. Okay then. <laughs> he <laughs> hasn't presented any more examples in this keynote. Okay. Well then, I guess our question is really important. For this example, we are not sure because he has just given a small piece of what the work is going on in the Microsoft lab. Right. But we still don't know how the finished product looks like and we, what would be the kind of input and what is the kind of output we are getting out of that system. So see, actually I think it's not a perfect definition because many of the tasks that I know artificial intelligence can accomplish, human cannot. You can, we cannot actually uh, extract patterns from one billion documents. Right, right. And better than mm -hmm. so. And the, the fingerprint, somebody mentioned no. right, And I have, I have two definitions, different individual definitions for machine works. Okay? Mm. One of them is only working, we introduce the, the job or work of the machine and machine work. Okay, that's one. And the second thing, we have intelligence machine multiple multiple the solution machine has and by its intelligence by its thinking okay or the decision making for example it's going to choose which decision is better mm -hmm. for that particular problem mm -hmm. so i think these two kind we are mixing we should not mix so that mm -hmm. is not intelligent so everywhere in many different like a factory like many things we can see machine works so it created by, or programmed by human even but in other hand, we have another machine works that we, we give some knowledge or some different kind of solution, maybe uh, 10, 20, 50, whatever, uh, native pro uh, solution for one problem. So by machine decision, it's come to the point that shows its intelligence, that okay. which solution is the best for that person. So classific you're excluding classification. Somehow. As, as exemplifying that, that capability. But, you know, I, I think your point is also really well taken. There's a number of functions of machines that are very impressive that supersede human capability. And the fingerprint recognition is certainly one of them. And, you know, all of the eye recognition and all that sort of stuff. Because it can master, you know, the entire distribution of fingerprint patterns, which we can't, we can't possibly do. So... I'm persuaded by both both of you. And a good example for this is, uh, you know, currently for disabled people, there is a machine, for example, when they are going to pass from the road, so from multiple ways, so they, uh, um, anything comes under uh, in front of them, so they are not able to see all of them, but the machine can stop or go slowly, faster, so that's intelligent chair, for example. Mm -hmm. This is my definition of intelligence. 
Yeah, so that brings in sort of another dimension. We have, we have mo we multiple have many ways of it. Context it's sensitivity. Against. Context yeah. sensitivity is the thing that that is um, demonstrating, right? Yes. It knows, it knows enough about its environment in order to choose a sensible reaction, which our handwriting example didn't really yeah, but have. The right? techniques are different, and um, we are not talking about the many ways, many ways of techniques. Definitely, we have many ways to bring it to the machine for to become intelligent machine. We are talking about which kind of machine can be intelligent, which example is good. We 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 uh, uh, make it separate that this is intelligent machine and that's only machine work, mm -hmm. like a routine work. Yeah. So that's why that example for only to choose which one is. Okay. Okay. What else does he have to say? I'm not very persuaded. This is our this is our top artificial intelligence guy. Okay, go ahead. Then he uh, he is explaining about um, the hybrid learning, which is a combination of language and vision. So for the first example here, how does this work? He's explaining that that in this picture we have a lot of words. Uh, the coat is of purple color, there's a lot of crowds, and there's a woman with a camera. I don't see a cat though. And then there's a woman <laughs> holding a camera. I think it's the, 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 the cat on her shoulder? It's the phone. It could be the fort. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't see the cat here. I think in the box there's something furry and animal looking. <laughs> I think it's like that other woman on her jacket has the... It could be a cat for it. <laughs> um, it it's a wrong cat, might be. Yeah. Because of the... <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Like, I think it's the on your hood, on your yeah. winter jacket, you have the faux fur. I have a better example where the machine has taken things completely wrong. Okay. I'll show you that. So here, first it detects words, what kind of words appear here, and then generate the sentences based on that, and then rewrite those sentences to make some meaning, meaningful, contextful sentence, I guess. So, so the, are the words superimposed on the picture, or are we just seeing the, the, the um, multimodal analysis of the picture in terms of words, and then forming a sentence? You know, here, uh, my understanding is the words are superimposed on the, the words are superimposed, okay. A lot easier. So <laughs> that's why it is detecting words wherever it is written. Oh, okay. You know, where the letters are not there and there is other kind of images. So it is detecting words out of it. The other example here where the machine has... So there's a guy on the skateboard. So the machine has detected it as a man doing a trick on a skateboard, which is very close to what human would interpret. A skateboarder is in mid of air performing a stunt. Are those the same? Close, not same. What do you think? A trick on, yeah, that's what the machine has interpreted. And a person says escape. Uh, yeah, that, that yeah. could be a human interpretation mm -hmm. of this picture. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Is that? Maybe he's falling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's another style of getting down from the skateboard. That's a style. Yeah. Getting down, yeah. Is there is there anything in the, what the human says that is not in the machine translation? In this, in this. Yeah. Is there intelligence exhibited in the decision to add that descriptor or not? If both hands were free, you know, something like lost.
So I mean, we're we're missing a we're missing a clause, right? The midair clause. And the computer assigns sex, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so there's something extra there. Right. Yeah. So is so so my question is, is there intelligence in selecting between skateboarder versus man, um, stunt versus trick, uh, midair versus nothing? Um, we had skateboard that got merged with the with the with the subject, is there intelligence in that word selection? And for those of you who are doing social media stuff, this is really important. Is there intelligence in that? Man acts in action. I mean, I mean, the second one is a more advanced It's almost like the, and maybe this is the point of the, of the frames there, it's almost like, you know how we saw in the first picture the words were already there? It's almost like there are a bunch of words that were being assigned to the rectangles on the photo, and then you just strung them together. And that's how you got the interpretation. Attention. Huh? Where is that? Yeah, where is the, exactly. Exact, that's exactly right. Where is the attention? It's nowhere. It's equally distributed. There's a man, there's a trick, and there's a skateboard, and there's no effort to direct your attention. So for that, they have, uh, corresponding to every frame, they have certain words here, which yeah. has some ranking with it. Mm -hmm. So maybe that... Ranking is generating the sentence here. Yeah. And the second one is interpreted by human. So in order to have attention, and in order to direct attention, what do you need? It, I mean, the relevance of attention is something quite subjective. You sure about that? Yeah. But if you and I are talking about um, um, if we're already talking about skateboarding, oh. you and I are already talking, we're already having that conversation. And then I show you this picture. Here's a man doing a trick on a skateboard. Wouldn't that sound pretty strange? As opposed to me saying, here's a skateboarder in midair performing a stunt. Which sentence sounds like a more natural extension, given that we were already focused on the topic of skateboarding? So, see, it, you, for instance, it depends, I say it's subjective, it depends on the query. You might query Google than skateboard. So you, you, might, you want to get the images contain only a skateboard. Mm -hmm. Skateboard and performing. Hand, on the other hand, if you issue the query like skateboard, stunt, so the, the second item is. Well, I just meant that just you and I are already talking about skateboarding, and then this picture comes up, and I'm going to describe it to you. Am I going to say the first thing, or am I going to say the second thing? Performing. Huh? Performing the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly going to say the second thing. Why? You say the second thing. Yeah, I would certainly say the second thing. Because, Why? Because Why? You, can, you can see from his behavior on the picture, right? Yeah. Is there any other reason? You We're already talking about skateboarding. Yeah. If, if his angle on a, a, a <laughs> skate, 
uh, a skateboarder was not this much, maybe angle was somewhat different, mm -hmm. so we would have not talked about performing. So we okay. talked about how he's going to fall to go down. Okay. So his angle, his angle on the uh, skateboarder shows that he is uh, completely controlling the, the skate. Okay. So it's, uh, somehow so it's, it's I think it's not. I think it's not as subjective as you guys are suggesting. But I think you're right to be focusing on the mid-air per per performance piece. And the reason that that's relevant is because it's new information, mm -hmm. right? If you and I are already talking about skateboarding, an important part of my contributing intelligently to our exchange is to add new information. I can't just add, I can't repeat old information. You'll think I'm daft. <laughs> you, you'll, you will think I'm not very smart unless I add that new bit is in midair performing a stunt. Now, if we're not talking about, if we haven't already talked about skateboarding and all of a sudden this picture pops up and I'm asked to describe it, then I'm allowed to say something more basic. But whenever we make an utterance, and this is extremely important for all of you guys who are doing social media, whenever we make an utterance, there's a, a, a shared context that's assumed. And the next thing that you add is supposed to add something to that shared context. And we want to look at that when we think about, about um, interpreting what it is that people are saying when they're... When they're um, posting tweets. Beth, you're looking really puzzled, like you just Well, I'm, I'm trying to remember, we read, I think it was the nicer paper that was presented, but it was talking, that related to your attention. It was mm -hmm. discussing how um, a lot of times in the attention literature, one of the things that is discussed is these sudden onsets, which is essentially what the computer is seeing, that they're just flash this image, that they're not given prior context. But what nicer was arguing in that paper with the cycle is that in, with attention, you don't ever have these sudden onsets yeah. that you know where the clock is on the wall, it just doesn't appear. And so I think there's some difference there, in, which relates to, to what you're saying is that you're, you're grounded based on your previous yeah. conversation and interaction, but the computer is missing really that continuous, that grounding. And that's intelligence, the ability to do that. Right. The ability to, to continue on. And, and so I, I think that's a struggle, though, with a lot of the artificial intelligence to have that continuation. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to remember where the paper. That's uh, well, it kind of, some of it came up in, in um, Claire and Jasmine's yeah. stuff, I think, too. Okay. So as we see, it's not efficient, but... We can certainly say that it is wrong here. So we have a detour uh, set up here and the machine <laughs> says a fire hydrant on the side of a road. Uh, the actual thing is two signs with arrows pointing to each other for a detour. Mm -hmm. So this was the example what I was saying that machine can guess completely away from the context or from the context because because that's because what's notable about this uh, it does has nothing to do with the fire hydrant right what's right. notable about this is the two detour signs you know pointing in the same direction which doesn't make sense and so you would certainly if you were <clears throat> to describe this to somebody you would point out the, the inherent contradiction in the, in, in the image and you would not be talking about Whatever that thing is, that orange barrel, because it's irrelevant. It's not important. It's there, but it's just not important. But the machine has picked up that particular piece of the picture. Yeah, because it doesn't have any sense of purpose, or it do it doesn't have any sense of well, the 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 um, the framework that I'm drawing on. I think I mentioned this before. Is Grice. Have we talked about Grice before, G-R-I-C-E, Grice? And it's a given new contract. And so what you want to do when you are conversing in an orderly fashion is uh, build on the given information by adding the new information. And clearly the new and important information here is these two arrows point, pointing to each other. So both of them are correct. But which one is 
Well, yeah, but it's but but it's the utility yeah. that makes it intelligent. It's not the accuracy that makes it intelligent. I think that's really the point. It's whether or not it's a use it's a useful summary yes. for somebody's purpose. And talking about the fire hydrant is not it's not a useful well, summary. I still usefulness is also again depends on the context. Sure. If I'm looking for the Images containing arrows, so that's enough. Doesn't yeah. matter about why it's actually there is such a sign. Yeah. But okay. So now he says that we already have systems which work to the predictions. We have collect have collected all the sense data, we create predictive models on that, and we give a predictions. Based on those predictions, humans, they decide what, which one we have to adopt. So his main focus is that we should have a goal, a dream goal, he says. We should have a dream goal which should create, which should make decisions for us based on the data provided, the predictions model, prediction mod, predictive models given on that, the system should be intelligent enough to make decisions for us. And eventually, it should lead us to active learning and active sensing part of it. You guys good with this? You want your machine to make decisions for you? Careful, are you sure about that? Well, we'll lose all our jobs. Apart from that. Not only job, you will also lose your senses. <laughs> no. Do you want yeah. machines making decisions for you or not? Careful. Okay, I have this fantastic machine in my house. It's, it's remarkable. It's got these little slots in it, and it's got these sort of heating elements on either side. And you put a piece of bread in. And you and you push this button, and and you turn it, and and there's this little sensor thingy on there, and it and it says, you know, this is how long I want this bread to be heated by this thing. My this thing, what is this thing? Toaster. Does it make a decision? Does it make a decision? No, it's just <laughs> it's why is, it's why is that time. Time. Huh? We are setting up a time there. It will just run it for that uh, period of time and then it That's not a decision? Decision? Machine is not deciding that. Human is deciding that one. And then that How one. long? Yeah. So okay. So I have. So what you want? You want this is Saida's answer. You want me to say to the machine, not this level of, of of brownness. You want me to say, I like my toast medium. And then the machine, if I say, if I tell it medium. And then the machine decides how long it needs to toast the bread to be medium. Then it's making a decision. And that is where we lag because medium is very subjective. And, and context dependent, right? I think they want the toaster to know how you toasted your bread for the past Three, 30 days and then make the decision that today you wanted how it was toasted. For a new, for an entirely new piece of, new type of bread. That would be even it better. should know that. It should know that. It should know and that that's you want your bagel a certain toastedness <laughs> or that you don't eat bread at okay, all. So, so toasters, really the toasters aren't intelligent. <laughs> okay, what about those automated cars? Are those intelligent? Actually, What's the difference? Actually, nowadays those car factory uh, are the selling bread. 
that have some, uh, I mean, kind of smart cars. I mean, they just processing information rather than making mechanically advanced things. So, so automation is intelligent. Well, in some luxury cars, we see that, you know, the dashboard, it shows you all kind of traffic, the routes, you know, all other kind of stuff. It is intelligent, but it is not intelligent enough to make a move which, I, which side it should move. Ah. Not, not move, but they stop. Yeah. yeah, now there are cars, they stop if there is yeah. a, you know, there is an but obstacle like, there. So that's making a decision. I think we're missing one point that there is a difference between doing a job and making a de uh, decision. Like suppose uh, the, uh, C is giving the presentation, suppose yeah. randomly we have given the PPT to her. She doesn't know what to do, whether to present, whether to delete, whether to uh, upload it to the uh, Google Plus. Okay. So that's the time she makes the decision. But when we say that you have to present it, then she is just doing her job. She is not making any uh, decision. We are instructing her, she is just doing the job. Right. Like the toaster you said. But I took the decision with the sites I have to use, right? <laughs> so I think even if she makes a decision, she has to know that she made the the right decision. <laughs> whatever that is. And I'm maybe computers aren't there yet to do an assessment of whether their action was accurate or what was correct. Well, I think I think I, I do want to I think you're right about the evaluation criteria but I think it's not accuracy I think it's um, um, addressing a purpose I, I think that's that's the criterion and that's what worries me about the decision the, the decisions so you could have a car certainly that would make decisions about when to stop and not not run over people but um, I worry that it about whether or not it would understand your purpose well enough to override its generic rules. So, you know, in general its rules are you stop at stop signs and you stop at, you know, stop lights and slow down at yellow lights and whatever, except when you have somebody in the car who has a heart attack. <laughs> and except when there's nobody else around. So, it's that sense of purpose. In, in the and the goals and I you know where are the goals here <laughs> where are the goals in this whole picture that seems that's the picture. like a, that, well I know that's a picture and you didn't make it yeah. that was her decision she she didn't make the picture um, but that that worries me that it's just missing a big piece of the of of, of, of intelligence which is the, a sense of purpose. Maybe this arrow is going somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> then he talks about the what are the opportunities we have we can deal with artificial intelligence and he is I mean, there are a lot more but he has mentioned these 10 things and specifically he has focused on the healthcare. He has talked about sciences, transportation, agriculture and sustainability. But he has main focus is on healthcare. Mm -hmm. You guys agree? No? He concludes in the paper that I read, which is related, something that we should all be concerned in that if this is all up to us being okay with losing our jobs or something, and I took offense to that. Oh. Okay. But the, the health care is suggesting, I mean, the example that's given is, oh, you can come to the conclusion that it's this diagnosis, but I'm not sure. I mean, it's, I still think it's a tool. What do you guys think? You're in the business. Shall we have these things making our healthcare decisions for us?
can't not have an opinion about this. You're making these things. Carcinate, yes. So we cannot totally depend on them. That's why we are human people. It just takes attention to us. And we are the one who make them. Okay. So it's not going to be making our decisions. It's going to be making recommendations, insights in healthcare. Any downsides to that whatsoever? Anything possibly negative about that? What about the system itself? About, about making recommendations? If the machine is hacked. Huh? If the machine is hacked. If the machine is hacked, yeah, okay. But even, <laughs> it, let's, let's, let's just say that, you know, really nice people were hacked. You know, is there any, any, any worry about the machine making recommendations. We decided that we're not happy with it making decisions, we're gonna have it make recommendations. Anything to worry about? My concern is that it will rely too much on it. So then we won't be able to make our decisions. Yeah, so tunnel vision, right? So somebody says, you know, see that red thing? And then all you're focused on is the red thing. And you don't look at anything outside. And when you're dealing with a person and the person says, see that red thing, you can assume that that person isn't bound by some kind of closed world, right? And so when they say, see that red thing, it's this, that, and the other disease, they have looked at all of the other possibilities and you know, and, and you can, you're relying on them to have screened them out for you so that when they focus your attention, this is, this is right back to that focus of attention question that we were talking about earlier, that, that it's focusing your attention and it's not clear that it has a sufficiently wide scope to, um, to mean what you think it means when it focuses your attention. Do you, do you, see, do you see what I'm... Yeah, so a good example might be um, the case, the guy who in Ebola in uh, Houston, right? Mm -hmm. It was Houston. Yeah. Where basically, if the computer didn't take into account that he recently traveled to a country where the right. Ebola was happening, just like what happened with humans, they released him and then contaminated more people. Yeah. So, or... Um, so not taking in the right information and it possibly when we when we give our talk talking about Zika and having something novel and not know that's not in the program. So right. are, is it yeah. just the flu or is it something different yeah. which could affect how the close the close world problem the close world problem really bites you on this focus of attention issue. Does everybody understand what the what the issue is here? Okay. So at this point I. I, w I have a question. You're going to fight with me. Uh, <laughs> I love a good fight. So, uh, here we are telling the human or yeah. the machine to follow a red light okay. or a red sign. Yeah. Let's just assume a person has a color blindness. A machine can still recognize it. Sure. But a human cannot. Sure. So, that's the plus side, right? And, you know, I mean, but we see this with people all the time, right? So, so Saida and I work together on something, um, event ontology. She's going to see things in that problem that I don't see. I'm going to see things in that problem that she doesn't see. But because we're both intelligent, we actually come to some agreement about these issues and ch and change each other's worldview, mm -hmm. and that doesn't seem to be happening, you know, with our machines. But you're you're right, and it, you know it's possible that you that you that the machine is a collaborator who sees things that you don't see, and and we do want to take advantage of that. You're right. Yeah, that's that's because uh, as I mentioned, um, the background that these people. Uh, this background got the same science, this background, cultural, ethnicity, 
experience in life. I love so much artists. So if I need such a things for machine as a context, it's, it's not that accomplished yet. <laughs> it's it's interesting that you should say that. What was the first thing I said when when this when, at the very beginning of this presentation? What did I say? But what did I say? I didn't use the word context. I asked you something about about something. What did I, What was the very first thing I said? Who is, Who is the sky? Yeah. And, the, and, the, and the next piece was what? Where Where did you go to school? For precisely those reasons. Because yeah. now I know, you know what his worldview is and, 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 and where he's coming. That is almost always the first question out of my mouth. Um, when I meet a, a new person or read, you know, read a new author, where they go to school. Yes, but I think that's your kind of decision. That's specific to that's me. Your kind of decision, okay? Yeah. That's okay. Hey, My mother doesn't do that. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so. You think that's just academics? That that, that worry about the background of the person that they're talking to? Yeah, I mean, uh, these things ha affect your reasoning. Yeah. Okay. That, that's why I say for machine it's not fully de uh, defined. That to make a reasoning according yeah. to this it, yeah. it have Although there are efforts in um, computer-assisted intelligent instruction, to tailor advice and, and instruction and pedagogy to the model of the student that the machine has. This is actually a really important part of computer-assisted intelligent instruction is that it has, a, it has a student model and it does phrase its feedback in a manner that's consistent with, with the student, which is, a, a, I, had, I had made that connection, but that, that Absolutely, is a place where that that work is is ongoing. Okay. So what she has mentioned that the background of obviously affects the decision, and it is true for any human beings too. Yeah. So uh, the way we are uh, educating humans, we have to educate the machines too for that, and that that is like a combination of uh, you know technology psychology, other kind of stuff. It's a tall order. Yeah? That's hard. Yes. Okay. So it's not possible unless you make a copy of brain <laughs> and give that data to machine and say, okay, make decision for this person. But still, I, I'll just give you an example. When I move to US, let's assume I have never watched any a Hollywood movie or show, I didn't know where, which side to drive in the US. In India, it's it's all left-hand driving. So if nobody... It is? Yes. Same with walking. Yes. It in is? India, in in India, India, I kept her walking on the wrong side of the street. <laughs> I never knew that. <laughs> Very confusing. I never knew that. Okay. So if, when I'm coming to US, someone has to tell me that so in U.S. you drive on the right side, mm -hmm. or I will learn by seeing where the traffic goes. Mm -hmm. So this kind of education, we have to give to the machine. So either we have to tell the machine that there is a right hand driving, or we the machine should be intelligent enough to understand which side the traffic is going. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the background is same for machine or human. It's easier to educate human difficult to yeah yeah so that 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 general issue um, I lump under common sense and that is probably the hardest thing to program is the common sense you can program technical equations and you know modus ponens and modus tollens and all that stuff but com the common sense yes. is really hard and if we can do that with the machines Probably we can achieve this. Yeah, that would that would help, but boy, that's that's very difficult. Yes. You're you're absolutely right. We have pictures of babies. So yeah, it's yours. 
Yeah. So for a long term dream, he is saying that machines should take care of our health and wellness without any human interaction. And AI is the best thing to achieve this. So it is important that this guy has a background in medicine. Yes. He's an MD. He's an MD. That's why he sees the promise. So are there any advantages to this? I mean, let's not be so pessimistic. What, 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 what if you really could get an AI system to do this reasoning, what would be the advantage? It's more accurate. Anything else? Close, close to mind reading. Twenty-four by seven availability, no holidays. <laughs> yeah, so same, same kind of theme. So just making healthcare accessible to a, you know billions of people who are without healthcare might be worth the error rate. If your choice is nothing at all, or an AI system, what are we going to do? We're going to, I think we're going to do AI, right? If you're, you know, you've seen these, um, in fact, we just had one, um, um, these uh, rescue stories of people in um, Antarctica who, who, who need medical care, and they don't have, you know, physicians there. To, it's actually surgical cases, so I think they can do the internal medicine. But suppose there were no internal medicine. Suppose there were no doctors. This is a real thing. This is a real problem um, on a mission to Mars. This is, some, this is something we absolutely worry about. Should you have a physician on a mission to Mars? Or should you use artificial intelligence? What do you think? How many want human? <laughs> How many are going to go with, a, with, with artificial intelligence? Well, there's no confidence there. I'm not seeing anybody. It could make, it could make healthcare available to the masses. And there's such a huge need. Are there humans on the spaceship? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, human mission to Mars, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm working on right now in my secret life. <laughs> yes, I. No, I she does not want to hear this. She does no, not there was an article about uh, vision changes. After yes. That. Yeah, so you read this. Yeah, yeah. And it, it looks like long-term vision changes for the space station crew that you know, to come yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big worry. Okay. So now what are the challenges we are facing these days, which he says can be eliminated if we use artificial intelligence in healthcare instead of humans. So this data was collected from Washington Hospital Center. Uh, it says that almost 20% of the patients are readmitted within 30 days of their discharge and 35% come back in 90 days. And the reason he mentions is that while discharging, when they are moving out of the hospital, there should be certain checks which are sometimes done, sometimes not, and sometimes not as efficiently it should be done. It all depends on the mindset of the doctor the state of mind, he's in, he could be busy, he doesn't want to do all the things, he just orders someone, okay, do this thing, this thing, and just moves out. But if we give all these things, the, the, the charge to the machine, it will do the same stuff for everyone. So there is, obviously there will be an error rate, but there, the probability of people 
coming back to the hospital for the same symptoms can be reduced. Are we happy? And this has been given by the Center of Medicare and Medicaid mm -hmm. Services. They say that 40 to 75 percent of these readmissions can be prevented. So it is the human error by because of which we are getting this kind of data. Boy, I want to see those data. <laughs> I don't know. But first of all, that seems really high. Doesn't that seem really high to you guys? No, the, the heart failure rate contributes to this. Uh, patients with heart failure, it's a huge problem. I yes. would say most of these people are probably heart failure patients. Okay, so yeah, what's the I issue? Would, so I would argue, though, that they don't have the right information, doctors or computers, to manage this. Okay. It is a interesting. It's a, it's a shocking figure. It's really high. It is very high. It is, it is that high. For heart failure? Yeah, it is really that high. high? Yeah. Heart failure is a big thing. Okay. So, in USA, the third largest cause for the death is preventable errors. The errors made by the doctors after the cardiac diseases and cancer. I think in addition to that, uh, also the amount of uh, believing doctors reduce because people can self Okay, so less reliance on the medical system. Yeah, they can get prescription online. So. Well, I just had an encounter like this. And I did a really crappy job of self-diagnosis. Really crappy. And I'm a reasonably intelligent person. So that scares me. That's why. Why did I do a crappy job? No, because you send your symptoms for, not for, for very crucial diseases, but for some actually maybe daily problems. You send yeah. your symptoms and you Yeah, but how do you know? Well, okay. Medic wow. That's pretty sh shocking. <clears throat> but Beth. In that medical error thing, isn't that going to be isn't that going to be stuff like infectious disease and hand washing and things that have nothing at all to do with decision making? Probably. Probably. Yeah. I think some of that has to do with the the uh, uh, the, the system and the transfer of care between people and and I'm not sure. Well, maybe maybe AI can help with that because it's a continuous it's a continuous record of what's happening. Mm -hmm. More information, so it could well, medical it. record systems. I think it's a great place for AI. Yeah. Actually, I would really, Which could really, really like to see that. The... Medical record systems are a disaster. But that's pretty. That's pretty sobering. <laughs> So he proposes, as we are discussing from this time, AI is safety, safety nets. So according to him, AI, the machine, should learn to detect anomalies in healthcare delivery, and machines should, should learn to predict, which can just shock the experts. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, he has mentioned the outcome within 48 hours. I did not understand the logic. He just straightforward say, give me this thing, I'll give you the results in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Probably that uh, they are working on something or they have some product from Microsoft which takes 
So there is a you know interesting work uh, done in John Hopkins University. This is they are treating they are teaching a machine the grammar of a surgery. So they are trying to sew the things. Mm -hmm. I have a small piece here. Wow. We're trying to recognize a grammar of surgery. These are human surgeons and uh, with, the, the, the student and team here are trying to figure out a way to recognize, for example, a, an insertion, a left transfer, a loosening, and so on. And this kind of, of ability has been applied in a number of robotics uh, 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 collaborative settings where robots work with people. I say this again last month at Sheikh Zayed Institute here in Washington, D.C. This fabulous paper and video came out in Science Traditional Medicine showing a robot, which is that, that, that thicker little pipe there, working with human surgeons hand in hand, collaboratively on a complicated procedure called an anastomosis repair. This is not a real one, the demonstration here, um, but it's the kind of repair that happens if you have to have your intestine repaired. And in this case, what's going on and what's being shown here is the power of these methods to do really fine-grained, regularized stitching, for example, using infrared uh, um, illumination and machine vision, as well as a model of hand-in-hand -hand work with What makes this a grammar? Well, uh, the grammar says uh, which point to uh, insert the needle and which, which side is loosening and all those things. So that is about teaching a machine here. I wonder if it's also the, the state changes that are possible. So, you know, so you start at state one and your grammar tells you you can transfer to state, you know, mm -hmm. two, three, or four. From state two, you can go to whatever, six, seven, and eight. Yeah, I wonder if it's like that. That's cool. So that's about... Uh, the healthcare, what he says in his keynote, he he's also talking about science and agriculture. In agriculture, he has given an example where by machine they can just go and count the number of apples on in the apple farm. And for transportation, he has a, a prob looks like Microsoft has built some product which can uh, work for the airplanes and they can figure out uh, the, the wind pressure and all those stuff uh, related to the aircraft. That can work. And in the end, he has given a video how their uh, Microsoft Glass, Smart Glass works. So that's the end. a sense for Microsoft. how we work. Uh, I mentioned before. Very provocative. Hybrid, hybrid and I think, I think the, the thing that transform and represent language uh, and visual data to automatically caption imagery. As we develop technologies, we have to think about, wow, how can we apply this even in a prototype? What would it mean? Let's find out more. And in, in, in the case with the image captioning pipeline, um, inspirational leader in the space, Mick Mitchell. Uh, Microsoft Research, who was working on the original work, uh, teamed up with Anna Roy Cool, who has a, a sight impaired family member, uh, Saqib Sheikh, who also is, is a sight impaired employee at Microsoft, and working with our cognitive systems team, Xiao Dong and Kenneth, put together a system very quickly that shows a direction. I'm going to just show you, and we'll have, uh, just, we'll end with. Uh, so I keep talking a bit about his experience with the system. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the pivot head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well? Or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces, 40 year old man with a beard looking surprised, 20 year old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. 
One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do. But artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate. And I'm really excited to see where we can take this. Hey. As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far off dream and building it one step at a time. So, look at it. Oh, yeah, the... so there. Google Glasses? Yeah. yeah. So, in addition, Google Glass, I mean, in addition to providing uh, annotation for the environment, uh, it also can uh, immediately share that photo, photo of the environment uh -huh. to uh, a platform that uh, can be annotated by the crowdsource. So people, can, I mean, he can might ask more advanced questions from this environment and people annotate that by crowdsourcing mm -hmm. that. What is this environment? And, and so, there are three applications for Google Translate that helps blind people. Cool. Yeah, that is cool. Well, I think the most interesting part about this was that it was forcing us to think about what it means to be intelligent. I think, I think that's the really key piece for us. And this whole discussion about whether or not you really want the machines to mimic human intelligence or compliment human.